today we're going to have a discussion about the fungi. And the fungi, as you remember, are one of the eukaryotic organisms that are studied in microbiology. So the fungi are numerous. There are millions, or 1.5 million uh, different species on the planet. And really the way to study the fungi is to focus on the ones that uh, that cause medically important diseases. And there's about 300 species that do that. And so both in this lecture and in part two of the fungi, we're going to really focus on the ones that cause disease. And if, depending on your use of this course, I'm presuming most of you will be going on to some kind of medical profession, in which case focusing on these medically important diseases is really the way to study fungi because otherwise you'll be uh, studying for years because they're very complex organisms. So fungal diseases are caused by the fungi that are common in the environment. They live outdoors but they also can live in tissue. They live on plants, they live in trees, they live in soil, they live in the indoors, and then of course they live uh, in the human organism. Most fungi are not dangerous, but they can be, and sometimes they can cause uh, death. Now, in terms of contagious diseases, fungi are not thought of as being contagious like bacteria or viruses. But, but certainly you can, so in other words, you don't usually get fungi from another individual, but certainly you could. I mean, there's been some cases where, for instance, the, the latest outbreak of fungal meningitis, individuals uh, caught the disease by getting injection of a steroid in their, uh, in their spine. So, so there are unusual ways you can certainly get a fungal disease, but in general, they're not as contagious as bacteria and viruses. So some examples include uh, athlete's, fur, athlete's foot, the dermatophyses, and the pneumonocystis is a disease that often occurs among individuals who have HIV and AIDS. And so, so generally, so there are some fungi that are commensal, and what that means is that they just live uh, without harm in another uh, human, for instance, host. And the Candida albicans, the yeast, so-called yeast infection that individuals get on occasion, uh, they live in mucus or on mucus membranes uh, in reproductive tracts. They can live in the mouth, they can live on the skin. So they're quite ubiquitous, and most uh, humans have certainly been infected with Candida albicans. Now, there are different kinds of fungal growth. So in this lecture and in the lecture of part two, I'm really gonna just discuss general biological principles. And that way, I think that that will provide some clarity when you go and think about some of these diseases that are fungally related. So one way that fungi grow is this, what's called vegetative growth. And with vegetative growth, you can actually have these separate sections, right, that bud off essentially. You can have a continuous, it's called a hyphae. You can just have a continuous hyphae that just grows bigger. Or you can actually have a spore and then you can grow a hyphae from a spore. Now, there's different uh, forms of fungi. It's called a dimorphic state. And the dimorphism has to do with, usually has to do with temperature. So you can have a fungi adopt a yeast-like growth pattern, and the same species can also adopt a mold-like growth factor or growth uh, type. And this is generally related to temperature. So the colder temperatures, the fungi is more like a mold, and the warmer temperatures, the fungi is more like a yeast. So the life cycle, so the, the the fungi can reproduce both asexually and sexually, and they can do so at least asexually by fragmentation. So they just basically grow another section. 
of their hyphae. They can also uh, reproduce or at least uh, reproduce themselves uh, asexually by the formation of spores that we saw in the previous slide can basically grow up into an adult yeast or an adult fungi. So these spores, they're not quite like the spores of bacteria, but they, they uh, detach, they can detach from the parent uh, fungi and then they can germinate into a new fungi. Um, and they can also have a reproductive spore cycle. And, uh, and these fungal spores can survive for, for a while in the soil, but they're not as durable and they don't have an extensive lifestyle or a, or a length of time they can spend outdoors like the bacterial endospores. So they're not quite as durable as those, but they can survive for quite a long time. Now, this is an example of fungal fragmentation. So you see that the hyphae has formed uh, basically another one through this, this uh, fragmentation. So it's basically grow a, uh, a hyphae and then uh, break it off. So that's, that's a fragmented kind of way of growing. Uh, there, you can also, the fungi can also grow through forming spores. And these spores are basically immature hyphae or immature fungi, and then they can grow up and be adults. So this is a way that, for instance, you can uh, reproduce oneself with spreading quite a few spores around the organism, for instance, and then you can get multiple fungi that way. Um, you can also, so the fungi do also have a sexual reproduction phase. There are three phases. There's plas plasmogamy, carogamy, and meiosis. Okay, and these just indicate different ways of conjugation. You can have an haploid donor cell, and, a pe and that donor cell penetrates the cytoplasm of the recipient. You can have a positive and negative nuclei fuse, and you can have meiosis diploid nucleus producing haploid nuclei, these sexual spores, then, then can recombine in various ways with other spores and form a diploid organism. So this is an example of an ascospore. Now the reason why I brought this example up is we're going to see that this is the general class that produces the disease histoplasmosis. So both today and the lecture next time, we're going to focus on some of these candidate diseases that will really bring forth some of the properties of fungi. So this ascospore, ascospore has a sexual reproductive phase that's formed in a sac called the ascus. And then here is a picture of both the sexual and asexual reproduction phases. So, so in this case, this particular organism can engage in either one. And here we have the ascospores and they open to release or the ascus opens to release the spores. They can germinate and then provide and then produce hyphae. And that this, this process, uh, this uh, fungi undergoes meiosis to produce that haploid spore that can then certainly combine uh, with another spore. Now, in terms of the asexual reproductive phase, we have the hyphae, and they release spores, and these spores can germinate and produce more hyphae. So there isn't any uh, transition to the haploid state. It stays as a diploid organism. So this is a, a picture, a slide, uh, or a couple of slides of specimens. So histoplasmosis capsulatum is an ascomycete that I just described. And it's a dimorphic fungus that lives, that both infects lung tissue and, uh, and causes histoplasmosis, and it also has a phase in which it can live outdoors. So the yeast, so you can almost see the yeast-like capsules in, inside of the lung tissue. So basically, uh, once the individual breathes in these spores, right, these spores 
embed in the respiratory tract and then they can actually grow inside the epithelial cells. Now here, these are, are useful. So this phase here is useful for diagnosis. And this microconidia, these are, are spores. They bud off from the hyphae. And these are, and this is the infectious form. And this is the form that gets inhaled, uh, for instance, when an individual contracts the histoplasmosis disease. So at 37 degrees uh, Celsius in, in the tissues, then the organism converts to a yeast phase, as you can see here in this uh, histogram of, or the histology picture of the epithelial cells in the lung. So here is the distribution of histoplasmosis. So generally it's, it's uh, found in the uh, mid part, the middle part of the country, kind of the south and the, and the north. So it's this whole area here, the Midwest, I guess, or Mideast, I guess you could call it. And it's, it, they really surround the rivers. They like to, this particular fungi likes to live around the Mississippi River. And you can see basically it's, pretty much distributed around the river, uh, the Mississippi. Uh, so here's another uh, picture uh, I, I obtained from the CDC. And this is a very beautiful picture because it really indicates all the different forms and how individuals get infected and so forth. So here you can see that um, the, the environmental form is the hyphae and, and in this case, it's living in, in an attic of a house. Uh, they're also found in the soil. And in terms of the infectious form, the individual inhales these uh, infectious spores that then become embedded in the lung. And remember, with the increase in temperature, then the uh, fungi turns into that yeast uh, morphology. And then we can also, so the um, serious form of histoplasmosis is the one that becomes systemic. And the systemic, so the, the infection doesn't just stay localized to the lung, it actually spreads to the lymph nodes and then ultimately enters the bloodstream and then it, became, and then it can become a seriously infectious disease. So these, and you can see here, the immune cells are, can certainly phagocytize them and they can be transported to the lymph nodes. And, but, but importantly as well, <coughs> excuse me, if they're not eradicated, this can become a systemic infection. So fungal diseases um, are generally called mycoses or mycosis and they're very, they're generally chronic and long term they're classified into five groups according to how deeply embedded they are in tissue and uh, what the mode of entry was so we just saw a version um, in the previous slide that systemic uh, histoplasmosis you can also have a subcutaneous form you can have a cutaneous form, you can have a superficial form, or you can have an opportunistic uh, invasion um, by a fungal pathogen, so to speak, even. So in the next lecture, we're gonna examine and provide example diseases for each type of infection that occurs with these different fungal organisms. And in discussing these diseases, we're going to pursue some of the uh, principles about fungi, like the dimorphism and the different reproductive patterns and so forth. So our first example is asking a very essential question that biologists often ask, which is, in what ways is a, fungal, is a fungus like a plant? And in what ways is a fungus like an animal? Now, you know, in a way, this question is not totally answerable because it's been a question that has pondered biologists for quite a while. But we can go through and list some of the principles where the fungi shares uh, aspects and characteristics with plants and aspects and characteristics with the animals. So let's just draw out our table. Okay, so our plants and animals. 
and then we'll see in which ways the um, fun the fungi actually resemble attributes of one or both. So in terms of its plant-like uh, attributes, it, it certainly looks like a plant, but in some cases it behaves like a plant. Okay, and, uh, and what that means is it can be stationary. Okay. Okay, it also releases spores like plants do occasionally. There are some plant plant species that also release spores. It also can grow by budding. Now, one way that it is not like a plant, it does not does not engage in photosynthesis. Okay, and in one way that it's like plants and animals, right, it, is, it engages in sexual reproduction. Okay, now in what ways, might you ask, is a fungi like an animal? Well, let's see. Does it have a plasma membrane? Yes, it does. Is it eukaryotic? Yes, it is. But, you know, a plant is eukaryotic as well. In what other ways might it be like an animal? Well, you know, I, I really, it, it isn't quite, I, I would say if this is a continuum, if this is a biological continuum, I would say that fungi resemble plants more than they resemble animals, but they certainly do have some animal-like characteristics. But the number one is the, the non-photosynthesis. It's a heterotroph, so let's just call that heterotroph. Okay, so really it is like an animal because it is a heterotroph. All right, so let's go on to the second example. So why or what generally causes a more severe form of a fungal disease? Number one, immune suppression. Okay, that we're going to see in some of our um, example diseases that uh, being immune suppressed is a very strong risk factor for having a serious systemic uh, version of a fungal disease. And we've seen that uh, quite often with HIV AIDS patients. Now, another, um, another way in which you can have a more severe form of disease is by a degree of exposure. Okay, so one of our principles that we studied in the infection patterns was if you have a high dose of the pathogen, right, then you're going to have potentially a worse case of disease. So these two things, I think, are the most important reasons why potentially you might have a more serious form of the disease. Also, the, well, let's, let's, another one is the mode of entry, right? That was another one of our infectious disease patterns is depending on the mode of entry. So we saw with histoplasmosis, for instance, if you happen to, what if you're somebody who is running a marathon, right, and your intake of air is much greater than if you're not active at all, and if you happen to get a very high dose of those spores, then potentially your form of disease might be much worse. So that concludes our introductory lecture about fungal or fungi, and uh, thank you so much for visiting educator.com.